Well, for those of you that are wondering what's going on this morning, we're starting a seven-part series entitled Uncommon Community based on the book uh, by that name. And uh, we would encourage all of you to stay for the discussion of session one entitled You Are Not an Island. So the title of the sermon is not original. It is from the book. Um, Some years ago, Marcy and I made a big change in our personal workout pattern. We uh, canceled our membership at EP Fitness and we joined a wonderful gym called Planet Fitness. It it was so easy. It was just, uh, it was an economic decision. It was cheaper. It was 10 bucks a month. I mean, how good is that? Um, But as we began to work out there two times a week together, I began to notice a few things. Uh, on their van advertising their business, it said $10 a month, no commitment required. And then I found out that their motto was, we are a judgment-free zone. We will not judge you. And then I read their philosophy and I wrote it down. And their philosophy was, we at Planet Fitness are here to provide a unique environment in which anyone, and we mean anyone, can be comfortable Our product is a tool that can be used by anyone. And this is what really got me. In the end, it's all about you. Well, that philosophy certainly fits our Western culture well. And to some degree, it it works for membership at a workout gym where you just want to get in and get out and go on with your life. The problem is a lot of times professing Christians take take that mindset into their view towards church. Uh, We cater to a judgment-free zone, uh, meaning we really don't want anyone stepping into our spiritual lives and gently pointing out a spiritual muscle that may need fine-tuning. You see, a lot of us who uh, carry our iPad or our iPhone Bible or an actual, you know, cover-bound Bible into church, we want a $10, no-commitment, judgment-free approach to church. We want to get our little spiritual workout, sing a few worship choruses, get our coffee, and go home and go on with our day. And in the end, it's really all about you. Conversely to that, when you study people in the past and the present, we we see that, uh, as for example, John Wesley put it, there is nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian, the great Methodist preacher years ago. More currently, John MacArthur put it this way, he said, Christianity is not an individual experience, nor is it a private experience. You were not meant to live by yourself in a world where you can isolate yourself in a massive world of temptation where you are in complete control and no one knows about what's going on. Real fellowship cannot exist in a world of self-created avatars. It requires real persons. End of quote. And we're going to look at this a little bit topically this morning, though we will be looking at a few texts. But I want to look at it from the perspective of the word isolation. Because the word isolate, or the word, the idea of privacy, is what the Word of God attacks and dismantles. And so we want to look, at, this is the three-point outline, it's not all going to go up on your screen right now, but it's, we're going to look at the alternative to isolation, the cause of isolation, and the cure for isolation the alternative to isolation, the cause of isolation, and the cure for isolation. And I think it's important for us to go back as we think about the alternative to isolation to how it all started. You know, you and I come in and we talk about Arminianism and Calvinism and Lutheranism and Methodism and Covenantalism and Dispensationalism and we have our Christian um, bumper stickers we have our real men love Jesus, you know, t-shirts, if you will. And so we bring a lot of evangelical baggage to the thing called Christianity. And we kind of need to step back and look at how it all started in Acts 2. 
uh, you, know, you realize that in the very beginning, in Acts chapter 1, there were 120 believers after Jesus had ascended to the right hand of the Father who were praying together, and the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost and enabled them to speak and to be, uh, to be heard in different human languages that they had not previously learned. And uh, they were asking questions of the apostles. What is going on here? Uh, this is not natural. This is supernatural. And so Peter preached, and it says that 3,000 repented, 3,000 were baptized, and 3,000 were added to the church. And no one who was added to the church who wasn't a Christian, and no Christian existed outside of the community of believers. Everyone was a part of the first church in Acts 2. Um, so, you know, this, this thing started with 120 people. It went to 3,000 people. And a few chapters later in Acts, it was at multiple thousands of people. And in less than 30 years, it spread from Jerusalem to Rome in less than 30 years. And at one point, church historians suggest that Christianity became the driving force even behind much of culture, surpassing Judaism and the Greco-Roman cultures. It was phenomenal. You think about it, people before the church was established didn't understand what it looked like to love your enemy, to show mercy to people who were not highly educated, who were down in outers. A lot of the things that we see today as mercy ministries, as caring for people who are underprivileged, was birthed through Christianity. And there was an attractiveness about Christianity. Look at um, the passage, if you want to look at Acts chapter 2. Just notice again the passage... Uh, beginning in verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. The word fellowship, koinonia, the common life that we have in Christ, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. There was a continualness about that. Verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with all as anyone might have need. And I love this in verse 46. Day by day they were continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were in public worship. They were in private homes all the time, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Look at chapter 4 and notice in verse 42. I'm sorry, in verse 32. There is not a verse 42 in chapter 4. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Notice they learned Scripture together. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They spent time together. They worshipped in the temple together. They ate their meals together. They praised the Lord together together and by the time you get to acts chapter 13 you see a church that was full of africans and uh, hebraic jews and hellenistic jews that is those who who were still jewish but they had been immersed in the greek culture Uh, you see non-jews you see greeks and gentiles barbarians you see high-ranking officials and slave men. And they're all in one body. They're all sharing uh, one life together. One uh, church historian, as he was grappling with the popularity and the attractiveness of Christianity, he, he said he made a list of reasons that Christianity was spreading so rapidly, why it was so attractive. And, and he said this, 
regarding its success, and I quote, more than any of its competitors, Christianity attracted all races and classes. Judaism never uh, quite escaped its racial bonds. Christianity, however, gloried in its appeal to Jew and Gentile, Greek and barbarian. The Greeks and Roman philosophies never won the allegiance of the masses. They appealed primarily to the educated, the morally and socially cultured. Christianity drew the lowly and the unlettered yet developed a philosophy of its own which commanded the respect of many of the educated. Christianity, too, was for both sexes, whereas two of its main rivals were primarily for men. And the church welcomed both rich and poor. No other religion took in so many groups and stratas of society. End of quote. As I mentioned earlier, the Greek word for fellowship that you pull out of Acts 2, verse 42, is the word koinonia. And it is the word that is, it speaks of our commonness, our commonality. Uh, and, and I like this illustration. Instead of the private pool in your backyard, picture the community pool that everybody is a member of. And you go and hang out there and you socialize there. It, it, it is a word that vividly reminds us of our common shared life uh, with God and His Son Jesus Christ and with each other. Let me give you some of the 19 different ways that it's translated in the New Testament. Not different ways, but it's used 19 different times. It's not only translated fellowship, but it's also referred to as sharing, a contribution, and participation. I remember a church that Marcy and I were members of for eight years, a Plymouth Brethren church. Whenever they sent a a missionary a love offering, they called it a fellowship. Fellowship. We're sharing fellowship with you. And that's very biblical if you look at Paul's thank you note to the Philippians in chapter 4 of that book. And I like to suggest that there is a vast difference between socializing and fellowship. The old adage is that every good Baptist likes a potluck. I don't think that's particular to Baptists. I think we all like food. And and I love to talk about the cowboys and, and talk about, you know... Uh, the latest politics or the latest weather patterns or what's going on in the world. All of that's interesting. But I suggest to you that fellowship is something far different than just socializing. Uh, It is more like eating a Thanksgiving dinner at Grandma's house than it is like sucking on a lollipop, which would be representing social interaction. Um. You know, it is possible that you could share the same theological convictions with other men in your Bible study and not experience fellowship. Conversely, it is possible that you could be driving in your minivan with your middle schoolers and experience fellowship. So being in a particular venue or a particular mode does not guarantee that common life is being shared in Christ. It's deeper than that. So we looked at the alternative to isolation, and that's really what this whole series is about, is pursuing koinonia, fellowship, a radical unselfishness, an interdependence, a move from isolation to interdependence. But let's move on and talk about the cause of isolation. The cause of isolation. The first cause is an ever-increasing privatization of our world. Back in uh, 1980, Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he spoke of the loss of serious thinking in Western civilization. And he said that serious thinking is being replaced by entertainment. In specific, the mind-crippling power of television. But, at least TV is and was a group experience in many cases. And uh, after Neil Postman's day, the, the TV screen didn't get smaller and smaller. It got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't even imagine Neil Postman could have imagined the 52-inch flat screen TVs sitting in our dens and living rooms today. But what he could not have foreseen for sure is that while the TV screens were getting bigger and bigger, there came the invention of a smartphone. Specifically, can I say it? The iPhone. 
He could not have foreseen that our society is beginning to see the results of the smartphone generation. That you and I, and each and every one of our kids, are very much a part of. Because whereas the big screen television is at least a shared experience with uh, our friends and family on Super Bowl Sunday, if you will, the small screen now puts you and I in charge of creating our own private world in which no one can invade. I just read uh, an excerpt of an article about the upcoming Apple Watch to be released sometime in 20, early 2015. And Time Magazine ran an article on the iWatch, or the, uh, they don't call it the iWatch, the Apple Watch. It's uh, co-authored by Lev Grossman and Matt Vella. And I just want to read some excerpts from this Time Magazine article in this cover story of Time Magazine. When the iPhone came out, it was praised as a design and engineering marvel. Because it is one. But no one understood what it would be like to have it in our lives. No one anticipated the way iPhones exert a certain gravitational tug on our attention. Do I have email? What's happening on Twitter? Could I get away with playing tiny wings at this meeting? When you're carrying a smartphone, your attention is never completely undivided. And then they go on to say this, the reality of living with an iPhone or any smart connected mobile device is that it makes reality feel a little bit less real. One gets overconnected, and listen to this next part, to the point where one is apt to pay attention to the thoughts and opinions of distant anonymous strangers over those of loved ones who are in the same room. One forgets how to be alone and undistracted. Ironically, enough experiences don't feel fully real until you've used your phone to make them virtual, tweeted them, or tumbled them, or Instagrammed them, or YouTube them, and the world has congratulated you for doing so. Now that is not me talking. That's Time Magazine just in the last few weeks. Before we move on to I think the deeper problem with privatization and isolation and cause of it, I do want to mention that in the world of the smartphone, the average high school student in America today spends nine hours a day looking at their small screen, their smartphone screen. And the theologian Carl Truman had this to say, he said, the language of friendship is hijacked and cheapened by the internet social network. The language of Facebook both reflects and encourages childishness. Childishness has become something, something of a textually transmitted disease. He goes on to say, relationships play out in the disembodied world of the web. Such are human amoebas subsisting in a bizarre non-world that involves no risk to themselves, no giving of themselves to others, no true vulnerability, no commitment, no sacrifice, no real meaning and no value. Now before we move on, I have an iPhone and I love my iPhone. It's a great tool. But it is important that we understand the days in which we live where any person, and some would even suggest that one reason that young adults are delaying later and later marriage is because they have created a virtual, a surreal world of relationship, of entertainment, of my private social network and my music list. And it is a dumbing down of face-to-face -face relationship. So we just need to be careful. We need to be aware of these propensities and we need to use it for God's glory and fight the propensities to move away from fellowship to isolation. But I think there's a far bigger problem 
and, and why we're isolated today. And that is because of our bent towards self. Or in one word, sin. Sin is the problem. You and I were born into a world as sinners. We were born into a world running from relationship with God and either attacking or escaping relationship with one another. The paradox of our times is that we have taller buildings, but shorter tempers. More experts, but more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We talk too much, love too little, hate too often. We've been to the moon and back, but we have trouble crossing the street to meet the new neighbor. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've split the atom, but not our prejudice. These are the times of tall men and short characters, steep prophets and shallow relationships. These are days of two incomes, but more divorce, fancier houses, but broken marriages. End of quote. And uh, I'm going to ask Charlie to put a, a graph up on the screen that uh, has just helped me as I, as I think about uh, why do we isolate ourselves. Uh, this is taken from a book by Ken Sand, who is a Christian lawyer, and he goes around the country and helps churches that are splitting se to seek reconciliation or marriages or... Uh, People, siblings struggling to come to resolution on an inheritance from deceased loved ones, etc. And so this graph really shows us uh, how we typically respond erroneously to conflict and why we move from relationship and fellowship towards isolating ourselves. And I, I don't have time to go through all of these, but, but the one on one extreme, it talks about escape responses or peace faking. Um, this is, I have seen in so many relationships. I've seen, honestly, some of this played out in my own life, and I see it played out in my loved ones, probably more than the opposite of this. Uh, it's just the way maybe our selfish and sinful bent naturally goes. And that is we avoid conflict. And so we soul up, or we give the silent treatment, or we just, um, yeah, we just kind of isolate ourselves. I'm reminded of the couple that uh, was asked, they had been married a long time, and, and uh, somebody said, could you give me the secret of your, your long marriage? How, how you've stayed together for so long? And uh, the husband said, well, whenever we have an argument... He said, my wife rearranges the furniture and I go on a very long walk. And he says, the secret to our marriage is that I've basically led an outdoor life. So, so that's one sinful response is uh, we tend to overlook or deny or flee and of course the ultimate outgrowth of that is suicide. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is we attack conflict. Uh, we get angry, and, and that can involve assault, litigation, and murder. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we don't see that extreme play out. But, but the point is, a lot of times it's sinful anger. It's sinful anger that plays out in a relationship. And, and I think for all of us, the closer that we get in koinonia, in a care group, or in um, a Bible study, or in the future of this church, we're going to have to grapple with the sinfulness of our own heart and our propensities, which is to escape. I think that's why so many people stay in a church and then unplug from that church and move on. I'm not saying that's every reason, but it's some of the reason. Or we attack the conflict in an unbiblical way. And, and so peacemaking is where the power of the gospel takes us. Um, and, you know, hopefully when we get into our one or two part series on forgiveness in this seven part series, maybe we'll get into some more specifics here. But the, but the point is we should look for reconciliation, for mediation. We should be willing to say with Peter, love blankets over a multitude of offenses. There are times that we just need to overlook an offense. 
And then, of course, according to Matthew 18, there's times that we need to go to our brother in private and address the offense. But it's helpful for us to, to understand that when Adam and Eve willfully sinned and disobeyed our Creator, that it not only brought alienation between them and their God, but as Francis Schaeffer pointed out, it also brought alienation between us and our spouse and our loved ones and our neighbors and our co-workers and our classmates and our teammates. And so this is just played out from Genesis 3 forward. And the good news is, for believers, when we get to heaven, there won't be any escaping of conflict and there won't be any attacking of conflict and there won't be any conflict because the power of the resurrection will realize its fullness in the presence of Christ. So let's, uh, let's spend the rest of our time just briefly touching on the cure, the cure for isolation. And I, I need you to go to, um, we're going to go to two passages, but first of all, go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. I think, you know, as, as I have thought about so many conversations that the under-shepherds here at GBF have had, and some of the frustrations that we've had, um, and the challenges that we've had, I think we have to start by, by dissing the idea that everybody who walks into church and sings the wonderful choruses that, that Aaron and others led us in, is a Christian. I, I think we have to be honest and say with Jesus that there are tares amongst the, the wheat and there are wolves amongst the sheep and there is darkness in the midst of light. And, and I think we have to go back to the basis of fellowship. I don't want to assume that everybody listening this morning is in fellowship is in koinonia, is, it has a common life. So look at uh, 1 John chapter 1. And notice in verse... Um, I guess just start at the beginning. What was from the beginning, which we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, these are the eyewitnesses of, of Jesus, the God-man when He was on earth. We proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us, with the apostles and those close associates of, of Jesus. And indeed, our fellowship is with who? So this, he's, he's talking about a horizontal, person-to-person -person fellowship. And then he moves to a vertical fellowship. Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. Now here's, this is critical. If we say that we have fellowship with Jesus, I'm on the Jesus bandwagon. I'm on the Jesus train. I have the bumper sticker. I, I, I listen to K-Love. But, we're walking in the darkness. We lie and we do not practice the truth. So, if somebody says, I'm on board with Jesus and Jesus' people and Jesus' talk and I tweet Bible verses but they're walking in spiritual and moral disobedience to the Word of God. They lie and they do not the truth. These are not my words. These are John's words. These are the Holy Spirit's words. Here's a little bit of a relief valve for us. Verse 7, if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light... We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Now here's the point. You could have your name on a membership list at Grace Bible Fellowship and not have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven. You know, there's a lot of things that are available to all people. The privilege of getting married, pursuing a career, playing a sport. But only Christians can experience uncommon community in its fullness. I wish I could say more on that, but I think it's good for us to move on to Hebrews 10 as we close. Hebrews 10 a very familiar passage that Abigail and Carrie pointed out to us. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And it says, and let us, and I take the us, uh, referring to professing believers, consider how to stimulate one another. I think in the King James the translators use the word provoke, stimulate. I think the NIV uses the word spur. It's, the provoke is kind of difficult. It's the idea of inciting. Usually when you think of somebody provoking or inciting, that doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound like somebody moving towards peace, but towards conflict. And yet the Holy Spirit is telling us that when we get together, we should be giving careful contemplation of how to urge one another on towards two things, love and good deeds. And then he goes on to say this, not forsaking our own assembling together. You know, there is a propensity, even among those who are walking in the light, who are on the ship. I love the way Barnhouse put it. Don't, don't say of a believer that they're out of fellowship. Look, if you're in Christ, you're in fellowship. And Barnhouse's illustration is this. If you're on the ship, if you're one of God's elect, if you have fellowship with the Father and the Son, and you mess up, you trip on the deck, you don't get thrown overboard. So it's not about being out of fellowship or in fellowship. If you're in Christ, you're in fellowship but you can have fellowship hindered by sin. That's just a, a thought for you to chew on. Um, go back to Hebrews 3. Just, just a little bit more maybe fodder for your discussion in the next hour as we break up into groups. Look at verse 13. Actually, verse 12. This is so good. Take care. This is Hebrews 3.12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another. How often? How often? Day after day. As long as it is called today. So that no one will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. How can I this day help someone grow in Christ? When is the last time I got the kids loaded up the car, headed to church, and thought, how can I encourage Robin and Karen in their ministry, in their walk, in their pursuit of Christ-likeness? How can I encourage Bob and Joy? How can I um, strategically provoke Marcy and Ben to walk in a manner worthy of Christ? You say, that sounds a little harsh. That sounds a little invasive of my private world. Yeah, if you think that, you're getting, it's starting to warm up. But here's the thing. Think about Jesus. He's comfortable in the Trinity. He's in the glories of heaven. And He smashes through the concrete from the ideal world to the real world of sinners. And He takes on humanness of people that He came to, but they rejected Him. And even at one point, the 12 men that he had invested of them, one proved to be a traitor. And all of them temporarily fled from the scene of the cross in his hour of greatest hurt and humiliation. 
And then to top that off, so he experienced horizontal isolation and rejection on our behalf. But then while he was hanging on the cross, he cried out in deep soul agony, My God, why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus, in ways that maybe we'll never even unpackage in eternity, experienced a vertical isolation from the very one that he had been in perfect communion with for all of eternity. And the beauty of all of that is that when you repent of your dead works and you trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and confess Him as Lord, all of the benefits of His isolation guarantees your koinonia, your fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with your brothers and sisters. So look around you as you guys break up in a second. This is the fruit of that. You have been placed in an imperfect body of sinners yet saints. And you have been called by the Spirit to encourage one another daily. Amen? Father, we thank You for just the brief moments we've been able to look at this very important topic. And Father, I thank You most of all that You made it all possible through the sending of Your Son. And when He finished His work, He ascended to Your right hand and He sent the Spirit. And Your Spirit indwells and causes us to know that common life we have together. Lord, we know that theoretically, but we tend to flee it, escape it, or attack it when we realize that others disappoint us and we disappoint others almost constantly. And so we thank You that there is grace, that there's forgiveness, that there is a calling to continue to work towards the world looking at us and saying, oh, how those Christians love one another. That they would see our good works and then glorify You in heaven. May that be true in increasing ways here at GBF. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. We're